Hi everyone. Hi. How are you all doing today? Good. My name is Nanjala and I'm from Kenya. In August 2017, like pretty much everybody in my country, I tuned in to one of the most unexpectedly riveting dramas that I had ever seen in my life. Now, it's important for me to caveat this by saying I'm a recovering lawyer. That means I have a law degree that I don't use, and it makes my mother incredibly annoyed. But for three days, nonstop, 10, 12 hours a day, I was tuned in to the proceedings of the Supreme Court of Kenya. We were watching what was the uh, presidential election petition. That means that someone was challenging the results of the recently concluded presidential election. It sounds really boring, doesn't it? And 90% of the time, this would be true. We had had presidential election petitions in Kenya in 1992, in 1997, again in 2007, again in 2013. What made this unusual was that for the first time, we were hearing evidence, we were watching evidence being submitted and debated in Kenya's, over Kenya's first digital election. The 2017 election in Kenya was unprecedented in scale. By some measures, it remains the most expensive election in the world. $28 US per capita. So this election petition was something to behold. Were the judges actually going to be able to understand what was happening? Could they tell the difference between the different platforms that were being used, acronyms, RFTS, EVID, you know? Would they be able to dis distinguish between the different concepts that the techies were throwing at them? What had we created actually in 2017? Had we created the most transparent selection in the world? Or had we created a black box into which information would flow and chaos would come out? As I said, my name is Nanjala. I'm a storyteller. I'm not a techie. I got my first smartphone about five years ago. I still have a very ambiguous relationship with my smartphone. Um, I love a lot of the things that we would consider technology, go vaccine, vaccinate your children. Um, I love Netflix. I love a lot of the social media platforms that we use. I'm still, as I said, ambiguous about my mobile phone. But as a storyteller, I'm very fascinated by what happens when worlds collide. When things that are not necessarily natural bedfellows, that don't necessarily naturally belong together, when they collide, then I get excited. Because you never know what was going to come out of it. And so what I'm going to do for you here today is, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about how an unexpected country in an unexpected corner of the world finds itself at the forefront of some of the most pressing questions in regards to democracy in the modern age. And you're probably sitting there thinking, Nanjala, Kenya, come on. Are you trying to sell me some snake oil? Because it's very difficult in the way in which we've set up the narrative of human history to imagine that an African country that is not the most, not the biggest, not the richest, not even, in by many measures, the most interesting, can be a place of learning, can be a place of insight. And I'm here to convince you that that is the case. What's happened in Kenya in 2017 
what we're still dealing with, the consequences of which we are still dealing with, are issues that everybody in this room who is interested in how politics and technology collide should be paying attention to. Why Kenya? It's not just because I am a Kenyan. It really is a combination of two things. I'm going to be drawing from this, for this talk, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be drawing heavily from my recently published book. It's called Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Politics in Kenya. And it's great that the theme of this conference is TLDR, because I'm actually going to give you the highlights version of the book. But I still want you to go and buy it. Because remember, I have a law degree, which means I have student loans, right? So I'm going to give you an overview of some of the arguments that I'm, I presented in this book, the ideas that I want you to walk away engaging with and thinking about. And it starts off, as I said, with the origins question. Why Kenya? Why not Nigeria? Why not South Africa? Why not Germany? Why not the United States? When I was pitching the book, a lot of publishers would come back to me with, Nanjala, why don't you write a book about Africa? I bless the rains down in Africa. Every time, every time I say Africa like that, that song jumps into my head. I bless the rains down in Africa. Why didn't you write a book about Africa? The truth is, and I feel weird having to say this, Africa is one of the most complicated social political constructions that exists in the world today. Yeah, 54 countries, but also thousands of nationalities, thousands of identities, overlapping, intersecting, many histories, many societies, many different political histories. Each of those identities and ideas collides differently with notions of what we would consider technology. If I had written a book about Africa as a whole, so much of the important nuance would be lost. So much of the important ideas would get just diluted into simplified narratives that obscure the reality of the condition. You've heard Chimamanda Adichie talk about the danger of a single story. If I had written a single story about Africa, so many important things would have been lost. And for those of us in this room, what would have been important is the idea of agency would have been lost. We seem to have this misguided perception that technology is something that just happens to people. Someone gives you a mobile phone and suddenly we are disrupting financial markets. We are disrupting communication networks. We are going to save the world. But really, technology is shaped by people. It is shaped by the people who build it. It is shaped by the people who use it. And so I didn't want to tell a single story that obscured from the fact that there is so much agency, both good and bad, happening, and not just in Africa, but really around the world, right? Technology is shaped by us, and I wanted to get into the reads of that. The second reason why I wanted to write a book about Kenya specifically is, as I said, an unexpected country in an unexpected corner of the world, finding itself at the forefront of some of the most pressing debates of our time. As I said again, not the biggest, not the richest, not the most powerful militarily. So how is it that in 2016, by 2016, Kenya was the world leader in mobile money? I'm assuming everybody in this room knows what mobile money is, making payments, through your mobile phone, mobile money transactions. In 2016, mobile money transactions in Kenya amounted to the equivalent of one-third of GDP. There is no country anywhere in the world that comes close, not even Germany, not the United States, to moving the amount of money that Kenyans move on their mobile phones today. Kenya is also the home of some apps that you might have heard of, Ushahidi, which allows people to, to map disasters around the world to um, allow first responders to respond urgently and quickly to emerging dis disasters. It's been used in Kenya, it's been used in Nepal, it's been used in Haiti, it's been used all over the world. 
how is it, again, a country that is not the most by any metrics finds itself at the forefront of these conversations? How is it that it becomes home to the most expensive digital election in the world? These are some of the questions that I seek to answer in my research and I seek to answer in my book. TLDR, I'm not going to go into some of the minutiae of some of these arguments, but I am going to give you the highlight story version of how Kenya ends up becoming this particular um, example and why it matters for everybody in this room to understand what went right, what went wrong, what technology promised and what it delivered and what it just could not fix. To me, the story of technology and politics in Kenya is inseparable, and it begins with elections. We are one of those countries that has always had, let's say, interesting elections. For the better part of, 40 of its lifespan, which is about 56 years right now, Kenya was a one-party state. Some of you who grew up in East Germany probably know what living in a one-party state feels like. It's being afraid of your next-door neighbor. It's being afraid of the person that you are dating or sleeping with. Are they going to turn me in for expressing the wrong political opinion at the wrong time? It's university students being rounded up and disappeared for saying things in class that challenge the official narrative. I grew up at the tail end of the authoritarian regime. I remember what it was like to be afraid to say the wrong thing in your own living room. In 1992, we had our first multi-party election. It was a violent election. It was an election that, in which the violence lasted over two years. Now, the thing that made it unusual at the time was that most of the violence was um, concentrated in rural areas. And that meant those of us who left in the city could still indulge in the illusion that we were living in, quote unquote, the most peaceful country in the region. The opposition today, to, to this day, claims that they won that election. And as I said, there was a presidential election petition. And the court decided on the technicality to award the election to the ruling party. In 1997, we had another multi-party election. Again, there was election violence. Hundreds of people were killed. Thousands of people were displaced. Um, it was concentrated in rural areas. The pattern repeats itself. And again, the opposition went to court, and the court said, on a technicality, let's award it to the incumbent. So by the time the 2002 election came around in Kenya, there was this sense of, we figured out the voting part. We have to figure out the transition part. We stand in line every five years, peacefully cast our ballots, vote. We know that the opposition is winning. And then something happens, and on a technicality, it's awarded to the ruling party. There was a sense of expectation. There was a sense of fear. You can imagine what it's like. As I said, up to that point in my life, I had not known any other party. I had not known any other president. I had not known what it meant to breathe freely. So you can imagine in December 2002, when the election commission announces that the opposition has won the election. Euphoria doesn't even begin to describe it. Suddenly, the horizons look different. Suddenly, the political possibilities look different we believed that something amazing was on the horizon. In 2005, we had a referendum, and we said, we want to get rid of the colonial constitution. We want a new constitution that better reflects our values as a modern nation. The ruling party, which used to be the opposition, turned around and said, actually, we want to protect some of the executive powers. Actually, we want to keep some of the good stuff that you gave to the former ruling party, we kind of want it for ourselves. And there was a lot of fragmentation. People defected. People left the ruling party. People left the opposition. And they came back and they went to a referendum and 58% of Kenyans said, nope, we want to change the whole thing. Stay with me. This background is important. 
Fast forward between 2005 and 2007. The opposition has just won an amazing referendum against the ruling party. They're fired up, they're excited. We have an election coming up in 2007 and everybody thinks we're gonna get them this time. What does the government do? They start to crack down. They start to crack down on the press. In 2006, the offices of the Standard Media Group were burnt down. Witnesses claim that they saw men in military uniform um, setting the fires, leaving the site of the crime. When he was asked about it, the then Minister of the Interior said on camera, what do you expect? If you rattle a snake, you can expect to get bitten. They were not denying it. First Lady goes on camera and slaps around a journalist on live television and holds a newsroom under siege for almost an entire evening. Again, reprisals, attacks. This is the climate in which we went to the 2007 election. And this is, again, the TLDR argument that I make in my research. The 2007 election violence in Kenya is both the instigator and the origin of some of the most important technological developments that we've seen in the country. By the time that election wrapped up, 1,500 people were dead. Over 100,000 people had lost their homes over a three-month period. What had started in 1992 had escalated and escalated and escalated to a point where it looked like Kenya was not going to make it. And so what did the politicians do? They sat in a room, they called Kofi Annan, the late Kofi Annan, and they said, help us fix this. On one hand, the outcome that came from that conversation was what we call the National Accords for Reconciliation and Dialogue. And it is a series of four documents, one of which is called the Independent Review Commission, or the Kriegler Commission. And the Kriegler Commission looked back at all of these elections and said, you know what the problem is? People don't trust the system. If we can just teach people to trust the system, then elections in Kenya will go better. And how did they decide that they were going to engender that trust? Let's throw some computers at the problem. Let's make this a tech problem, right? And I hope you can see where I'm going with this. Um, but at the same time, at, away from the formal strictures, away from the formal societies, there was agency. There was creativity. There was people looking at Kenya and thinking, we can do things differently. By 2006, Kenya had one of the largest diasporas in Africa. 2.62 million Kenyans were living abroad. So that, at the time, that was about 10% of the population. These were people who would statistically be considered highly educated, so people with a university level education and above. I was part of this diaspora. I was studying abroad. And I can tell you that there is nothing as horrifying. Well, I'm sure there are things that are more horrifying, but for me, the horror of sitting thousands of kilometers away, trying to get information about your country, watching the news every day and seeing all of these horrific stories about people being killed and disappeared. January 2nd, 2008, the worst incident of civilian inflicted violence in Kenya, in which about 38 people were burnt to death in a church in Kiamba. Can you imagine what it's like to be thousands of kilometers away from your family and from your friends and reading that news from CNN, not being able to get information from that? What did this diaspora end up doing? People organized online. Concerned Kenyan writers, Mashada forums. People went and started blogging with a frenzy that has not been matched since. Remember, these are people who statistically would be considered highly educated, people who are able to speak into the reality of the country, but also to process that information for the benefit of both an external and an internal audience. At the time, the local papers, the local TV, now you go online and you can watch Deutsche Welle for free. This is 2006. 
Sometimes they updated the websites, sometimes they didn't update the websites. Sometimes there were pictures, sometimes there were no pictures. This is the local press. So blogging became a substitute for the press. Social media, Facebook had just launched in 2006. A lot of people had started to use social media, but we had a major uptick coming in the shadow of, I need to keep in touch with my family. Another important thing that had launched in 2006, M-Pesa, mobile money. Now, if you live in a country where credit cards are all the rage, or you know, now you take Venmo and PayPal for granted, but you have to think about Kenya as what we call a dual system. I live in Nairobi, my parents live in Nairobi, but my grandparents live on the other side of the country. My uh, cousins live on the other side of the country. And when the violence breaks out, suddenly it means that I can't go to my grandparents. I can't send them money. But they're dependent on those returns, on that money that I send them every month to make ends meet. What mobile money does in a vacuum like this is it makes it possible for people to live in a, who live in a dual system to keep communicating to keep reaching out to each other. We're finally able to keep sending money even though I physically cannot get there because of what's happening in the country. So you get the sense that it's an, or kind of like a, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Sure, the country is falling apart. Sure, we're anxious and we're frustrated and we're angry and we're confused. But we're not just sitting there and taking it. We're coming up with things. We're developing things. We're using existing platforms to build new things. And as I said, this is my TLDR argument. You cannot separate what happened in what I call Kenya's first digital decade, 2007 to 2017, from what happened in 2007. Politics and technology in Kenya are inseparable. The aftermath of this era of confusion, as I said, is a significant amount of innovation. If I say the phrase Silicon Savannah, does anybody in this room know what I'm talking about? Or have you at least heard the phrase, right? This massive wave of people trying to encourage off the back of the success of Ushahidi, off the back of the success of all of this strong web presence, people trying to incubate a system whereby tech is uh, king. We don't make things in Kenya necessarily. We don't have oil. We don't have, you know, our biggest um, sector at the time is tourism, service industry. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to do something different. And so you have this massive movement of resources towards making that happen. But at the same time, you have all of these people who are encouraged and inspired on their own, creating, making, trying to make space for a new political narrative. By 2017, there were 12 million Kenyans on Facebook. When I say that number here in Germany, you might look at me and go, okay, there's like 12 million people in Berlin. What's your point, lady? Um, in 2015, there were 5 million Kenyans on Facebook. And in 2013, there were only about 2 million Kenyans on Facebook. What does that graph look like? The exponential uptake of social media. Right now, the biggest social media platform in Kenya is not even Facebook. It is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is what we call dark social. It means it's a social network that generates, I cannot see your connections, I can't see who you're talking to, but what you're doing on WhatsApp generates internet traffic. Why am I throwing these numbers around? What happened between 2000 and 2017 is a kind of collision between what people were doing on their own, away from the state, 
and what the state was trying to do that culminated in the 2017 tension. As I said, on one hand, you had a massive wave of people moving towards online platforms, first blogging and then substituted into social media, microblogging. You had a massive uptake of people using social media as a substitute site for demanding accountability, demanding good governance, building new communities and ways of being. My favorite example of this is what I call is what is called hashtag my dress my choice. Has anyone seen this hashtag? In 2015, a young woman was beaten and assaulted um, in a street in Nairobi um, for quote unquote being inappropriately dressed. Stripping, unfortunately, in itself, not an unusual thing. It happens in Kenya, especially during moments of political unrest. One of my former law professors calls women the canary in the coal mine of political unrest. If you look at what's happening with the rights of women in any society, you can get a pretty good reading of what's happening in the society in general. So when spiking, when you see a spike in stripping attacks against women in Kenya, we know that things are going badly. So she gets beaten and assaulted but for the first time in 2015, unlike in 1997 or in 1992, there is YouTube, there is Facebook, there is Twitter. Yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff. There's a lot of people who document such attacks for the titillation of audiences, people who film violence for entertainment. But there was also a group of women who had been on Facebook and they had actually started out as a mother's group, you know, organizing carpools and, um, you know, keeping the, the, the neighborhood um, looking good. And they said, enough is enough. I've just received this video of this woman being assaulted and I've had it. I need something different to happen. We need to have a march. We need to have a protest. We need to have a petition. And all of these things happened. And for the first time, at least in my living memory, the government was forced to respond. We have assault laws in the books. In cases like this, they're very rarely enforced. But because these women, this group, grew into a movement on Twitter, on Facebook, into a petition with over five million signatures, for the first time, the government could not pretend that it did not know what was happening. And so my dress, my choice becomes the first case, at least in my living memory, whereby the department of, uh, the director of public prosecutions is forced to bring a case against a person who was identified courtesy of a video that was taken and posted on social media. This is just one example, justice for Khadija, justice for Fatuma, justice for Aisha, Women in Kenya especially, who have found themselves shut out of traditional media platforms, have turned to social media, have turned to digital platforms as a place to tell their stories, as a place to keep institutions accountable. That's good. We've seen people pushing back against the narrative of ethnic politics. Ah, Kenya, politics is just tribalism. That's what the narrative is. And this narrative makes people inactive because they think, surely if everybody else is doing ethnic politics, why should I try and do things differently? If this is how we've always done it, then this is who we are. But suddenly, because you see people building new networks of support, of inclusion, the narrative starts being challenged. One of my favorite hashtags on Kenyan social media is called Ke where people basically ask for work. I have a BA in architecture. I've been out of work for a year and a half. Can anybody offer me an internship? Hashtag Ikokazi Ke. And there are people who have gotten jobs. There are people who have gotten resettled after election violence. There are people who have gotten all kinds of support outside the traditional bounds of ethnicized politics. This is important. And that's the good news you probably already have a vague sense of what the bad news is. 
it's really interesting to be having this conversation in Germany also because I think <laughs> um, you guys are also experiencing what we are experiencing. That as easy as it is for the good guys to find each other, it's just as easy for the bad guys to find each other as well. And people are building new networks that incubate hate speech, that incubate violence against women, that incubate violence against people who are of religious or ethnic minorities. It's very tough to be a Somali Kenyan on Twitter today. It's very tough to be of a religious minority in Kenya today because of the f speed and the frequency at which hate speech flies. But there is another layer to this. And as you go into the European parliamentary elections, this is something that you should be paying very close attention to. What happens when people realize that money can be used to shape how people behave online? When I say the name Cambridge Analytica, I, people often think about Brexit and then think about the Trump campaign. What if I told you here that Cambridge Analytica has been active in Kenya since 2011? That they were actually instrumental in the 2013 Kenyan election that brought into power the Jubilee administration? As I've mentioned that the 2017 election was the most expensive election in the world. That's the formal spending. One survey found that the pre an average presidential election, a presidential election candidate in Kenya spends 50,000 US dollars on their campaign. In 2017, the Jubilee administration spent 60,000 US dollars on Cambridge Analytica alone. It was one of three different um, corporations that they employed, British corporations, American corporations that they employed to run their social media, their digital presence. The opposition also invested greatly in data analytics in using social media to influence public opinion. At the same time, we had a great deal of the issue, a great number of the issues that had come up in 1992, in 1997, in 2005, remaining and answered. What would be the role of the media, right? What would the story would the media tell? One of the first things that happened after 2007 is the media saying, actually, we don't want to be implicated in creating chaos in Kenya, and so we're going to take a step back we're not going to be as critical. We're not going to be as analytical. We're not going to be as pushy as we need to be. And so social media blogging becomes a surrogate space for creating information and disseminating information about what's happening, about the political conversation in Kenya. What vulnerabilities did that create? What does it mean when people get their political information from online sources? It means you don't have any of the things that you take for granted with traditional media. There is no verification. There is no fact checking. There is no proof. Anybody who ha can afford it can buy an IP address and set up a website and claim to be generating, disseminating political information. For us, what that meant is that we stumbled into an election in 2017 in which people were not reading from the same script. Look, we can disagree all you want about political outcomes. We don't have to agree on anything about politics. But for a political for a society to function, we have to at least agree on the facts. We have to at least start from the same place. But if I'm telling you that vaccines are good, and you're telling me that you read on a website run by Dr. I just made this thing up, and he told you that it was spreading autism, then we have a problem, because I can't argue with you. This was a huge problem in 2017 in Kenya, was that people were not operating with the same facts, and therefore the political discourse becomes meaningless. It's just people talking past 
each other. Overall, the lessons from Kenya's first digital decade have been, number one, agency. We all have the power to shape how technology functions. We've given far too much room and far too much leeway to tech companies to determine the parameters of this conversation. Just because, and I don't know if I should say this because I think they're a sponsor, oh well. Just because Google says, first do no harm, doesn't mean that you just have to take their word for them. We have the power to keep these companies accountable for what happens next. The first thing that we realized is, very quickly in the Kenyan political process, is nobody really cares what happens in Africa. None of these tech companies really care about what happens in Africa. Um, Twitter probably didn't set out to play a starring role in keeping the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission in Kenya accountable. But it did, because of the agency and the creativity of Kenyan people who decided to use whatever platform was available in order to make accountability happen. Hashtag, where is my Form 34B? When the Electoral Commission made an announcement and said, these are the results of this polling station, people went to the polling station they photographed the official results. They went on Twitter and they said, actually, whatever is being reported on that website is not what was announced at my polling station. That result is inaccurate. That is agency. That is creativity. The other thing that we learned from our experience in Kenya's first digital decade is that money and politics, when you mix money and technology and politics, without any kind of framework of oversight, of accountability, you are asking for problems. We threw technology at some of the most complex social and political issues that our society had faced. We said to Kofi Annan, listen, if we just put computers into the system, it will engender trust and everything will be okay. We tried to absolve ourselves from the very important questions that needed to be asked about our polity. And of course, it backfired spectacularly. Spectacularly. $28 per head. And that was just the first round. Keep in mind, we ended up doing it twice. Um, and what did we get for it? I would argue that Kenya is more uncertain today than it has ever been. I would argue the political system is more compromised today than it has ever been. And I get frustrated because I look at the Gambia, which voted out a 22-year-old autocracy using marbles. Literally, you would get a marble, you would put your marble in your desired candidate's drum, and then they would count the marbles and they would say, yep, this guy won. Ended a 22-year dictatorship using marbles. The lesson in Kenya is throwing technology at your problems, at your social and your political problems, it's not going to fix it. Throwing money, especially, at these problems without interrogating the source of that money and the interests of that money creates far more problems than it solves. You're sitting there thinking, wait, Nanjala, this sounds like a whole lot of things that Kenyans did to themselves. None of the companies that have been implicated in the complications and the frauds of the 2017 election are Kenyan. They are French, they are American, they are British, they are from the United Arab Emirates. What has happened is that we have made elections a massive profit-making industry and that has created parasites and has created an opportunity for what I call digital colonialism. People leaving Europe, leaving the Middle East, leaving North America, going to some of the most fraught social and political situations in the world, influencing political behavior for a quick buck. That is exactly what colonization was for. It was using 
other people around the world to make money here. It's really important for me to make that point in this room because I think sometimes, as I said, we tend to think of what happens around the world as an abstraction, right? As long as it's happening over there, then I don't have to sit in the discomfort of what is being done in my name. Well, I'm here to tell you, as a person who has lived through some of the ugliest chapters of her country's history, that you do actually have skin in the game and you do have things that you can do here in Europe that would help us halfway around the world. What happens in Africa, what happens in India, what happens in Brazil, what happens with all of these tech companies that are fundamentally American tech companies is something that you should pay attention to. It's something that has an impact for us and it's something that you can help protect us from simply by paying more attention and asking some of, sitting in the discomfort of some of these issues that have come up. I know it seems like I'm telling a very sad story, and in some ways it is. I was definitely a much more optimistic person in January 2017 than I was in December 2017. I feel like I've seen, as I said, the best and the worst of human nature over a 12-month period. I saw people using social media to keep the police accountable for police brutality. I saw people keep the Independent Election Boundaries Commission accountable for the fraud that was attempted um, in 2017. But I also saw people disseminate some of the ugliest hate speech that I've ever encountered in my life on social media. I've seen technology build and destroy. And I want to leave you with that particular note. I'm not a tech optimist or a tech pessimist. Really, I consume the same as anybody else. What I am, I hope, is a tech realist. And as a tech realist, what I can remind you is human beings are part of the equation and must always be part of the equation. We can't use technology to absolve ourselves from some of the more difficult conversations that we need to have about the kind of social, about this kind of societies that we want to build. We can't pretend that the decisions that we take in how we build technology and how we deploy technology in one part of the world or in another part of the world are not connected. We can't pretend that our agency and our creativity doesn't matter. Um, I leave you with one story from the Supreme Court proceedings, and it's one of my favorite stories to tell because I still can't believe that it happened. The Chief Justice in Kenya, the current Chief Justice in Kenya is a very stoic man. He wears his glasses. Anybody who wears glasses knows this look, you know, when you, when you look at people over your, your glasses to intimidate them. And in about the second day of the proceedings, the lawyer for the Independent Election and Boundaries Commission was um, challenged. He had, evidence had been submitted that basically said um, what they were presenting was inaccurate. It was untrue. This is illegal. And the lawyer said, Your Honor, I want you to just ignore that. Whatever was on the website, don't pay attention to it. Whatever had been used for the local international reporting as the basis for announcing the results for swearing in, ignore it. It's not true. It's not real. And the Chief Justice did that thing with his glasses where he looked over and he said, if they weren't results, if they weren't the official results, then what were they? And the lawyer goes, um, 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 they were just statistics. And as a person uh, who had been watching the results, it was kind of like, you know that moment if you watch Friends, I know Friends is very popular in Germany, when Ross says we were on a break, and you just can't believe that someone would have the temerity to say something like that? That was the moment for us, as those of us who were watching the proceedings, where we realized that everything that had happened, everything that we had been sold, was a lie. If the lawyer could stand in front of the Supreme Court judge and said, they were just statistics, pay no attention to them. Thank you for your time.
Nanjala Nabola. Your applause. I think we have more than enough time for a Q&A session for questions from the audience. So if questions arise, there will be a microphone in the middle of the room. So if I see your hands, I can point the guy with the microphone to you. So do we have questions so far? Yes, in the front row here to the left. First of all, thank you for your inspiring talk. I have a question. In uh, what way do you think is it important to create more access to venture capital in African nations in order to give entrepreneurs from the area the, the possibility to create technology solutions that are funded by members of that specific society uh, as opposed to international corporations abroad? Okay, should I take? Just answer the question. Is this a question about Jumia? Because Jumia is a, is a German company that is building itself as an African company. And it's raised a lot of questions about funding and tech. I, I'm not a venture capitalist. I don't know anything about venture capital. Um, I think that I'm really more of an activist. And my uh, imp impulse as an activist is always to begin from a point of solidarity. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, if you have come to save me, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because you realize that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I think, I think a willingness to get into the trenches, I think a willingness to actually be in solidarity with the corporations or the individuals or the innovation people that you want to work with, I think a willingness to absorb, uh, absorb risk and take authentic risk um, is an important thing to think about. Um, but as I said, I am not really a venture capitalist. Um, I guess as the kids say, YOLO, try it, see what sticks. <laughs> okay, more questions? Have I answered all your questions? Yes, here, to the left. Hello. <clears throat> um, thank you for your very balanced talk, and it was, as he said, very inspiring. Um, I liked your, how you talked about how Europeans as well have uh, their skin in the game. And when you said that, I was just asking myself, what do you think is the role of Europeans, or how can they or we um, dismantle some of these structures of uh, digital colonialism, as you described? I love that question. I love that question so much. I think it's such an important question. Um, well, the, the most direct route actually maybe has a little bit to do with the venture capital question is shareholder accountability. Many of these are listed companies. And to really start to ask questions about where your money goes. Um, if you actually start to pass through what your pension fund is investing in, to pass through what your, you know, some of these investment vehicles that are presented as neutral things, if you really start to ask questions, then you end up with a lot of really interesting answers as to how the biggest military industrial, for example, uh, complexes get funded and get financed. Um, but when it comes to this particular question, is to start with the shareholding and start to see, well, is there a way that people who own parts of these companies can be forced to pay attention to what it is that these companies are doing? Some of them are not listed corporations. Um, some of them are uh, private, you know, like Cambridge Analytica was a private um, corporation. Support investigative journalism. Support people who are actually trying to hold a lens up to these stories. As a Kenyan writer, one of my biggest points of frustrations is this, is that 
I would love to be able to tell all of these stories. I can't afford to tell of these stories um, the way that I would want to tell these stories. And I see things and I'm paying attention to things because I live in that context that a person who comes to Kenya three weeks before the election talks to five people and then goes back to Berlin or Paris or whatever is not going to be able to see. And so to really work, as I said, in solidarity with some of the people who are actually trying to keep people accountable in this particular context. With the Kenyan election, many of the European companies, this has been a major problem, is that Kenyan journalists knew some of this stuff was happening long before Western journalists knew what it was happening. But nobody paid attention to the Cambridge Analytica story um, in thorough detail because the Kenyan journalists were scared because it is a scary context um, and intimidated into not reporting the story. And the Western journalists didn't see this tech politics conversation as something that was worth engaging with in detail until the Brexit vote, until the Trump vote. So uh, when I say that, I, I see two things that need to happen. One is we need to be better at talking to each other as equals. But at the other t on the other hand, I think we need to um, shift the central narrative referent object of how we tell stories about the world. Um, everybody came to Kenya looking for violence and a violent election. And when the violence didn't, violence didn't emerge the way they thought it would have emerged. There was a sense of, I don't know what's happening. I don't know how to tell this story. And that to me is a great opportunity to look at a local journalist and say, hey, what's the story here? How can I tell this story better? Have I answered your question? Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, please. Here in the middle of the one, two, three, four, five, six row. So, um, Asante Sana, um, you know, we don't know much about Kenya here in Europe, mm. and, and what we hear about Kenya is, is good news. It's told us there is good news happening in, in Kenya. Kenya is leapfrogging. Kenya has done things others haven't done. Uh, 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 Vodafone, which is also a telephone uh, uh, provider here, has invented mobile money, and... Um, um, Copa has uh, electrified more houses in, in, in Kenya in a few years than, than the, the national grid in, in, in decades. Is, 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 that, is that narrative we hear about Kenya, this hooray narrative, is that your narrative as well? <laughs> Sorry, I had water in my mouth. Um, I am not a tech optimist or a tech pessimist. I like people. I like to pay attention to what people are doing. And I think this is not a Kenya problem. This is not an Africa problem. This is a global problem. I think tech companies have been very good at selling snake oil and have been very good at building narratives around why they exist so that Google is not just a search engine, but is, you know, connecting people and fixing the world and whatever. And we have become so enamored with all of these beautiful, complex, oh my gosh, they're saving the world narratives that we've become less good at paying attention to what they're actually doing. I think that we have a situation whereby tech has enabled a great deal of creativity and a great deal of innovation. And in many ways, as I said in the beginning, Kenya is an outstanding example of how, given the right tools and given the right means and platforms and whatever, people can do amazingly creative things. But it's never really that simple. I think um, we have a lot of challenges. And I, I like that you picked MCOPA because 
I think if you talk to people who work in tech in Kenya, their version of the MCOPA story is a little bit different <laughs> from the story that is told. Um, to me, that's really a reflection of how we, as the public, have stopped asking or expecting things to be boring but clear and direct and efficient. We like the snake oil. We are the hipsters who don't just want to eat cheese, but we want to eat artisanal cheese that has been farm to pasture cattle that get a massage every night before they go to bed. It's, it's cheese. Just eat the cheese or don't eat the cheese. So I think that's kind of where I land on that conversation. There's a lot of amazing people doing amazing work in Kenya. There's a lot of really terrible things that are happening in the tech space in Kenya as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Nanjala Nyabola. <laughs> Yeah.